Hey guys, this is Floyd here with Curbside to Bedside. I'm joined with your other co-host, Ron Hunter, who said that I had to do the intro since he did it last time, and that's only fair. Yeah, it's a it's a democratic society that we uh, we run here. Yeah, we try to divvy things up. So today on Curbside to Bedside, we're going to discuss a few rudimentary basics of oxygenation, ventilation, and we're going to attempt to ameliorate a few cliches that have been espoused for a while. So let's dive on in. First, oxygenation and ventilation are not exclusively the same. Since the widespread adoption of waveform capnography in pre-hospital medicine, I've actually heard from a few who boldly claim that entitled CO2 is superior to SpO2, and they infer that it is somehow preferred over SpO2. To be clear, they are two totally different physiologic parameters and should be viewed as such. For instance, a person can have critical tissue hypoxia, i.e. a low SpO2, and they can be ventilated with a normal PaCO2. The converse is also true. A person can have a sky-high PaCO2 due to apnea and or hypoventilation and have a completely normal SpO2. Today's focus is going to be on oxygenation. Our first podcast was on entitled CO2, so you may want to go back to our first podcast and listen to that if you haven't already. We'll drop a link to that in the show notes for those of you who are just coming into this. Sure. But to piggyback off of what Floyd was saying, in our area, most EMS agencies can't perform RSI, say for the uh, helicopter EMS guys. But we do occasionally encounter patients who have already reached critical hypoxia. So that's typically defined as an SpO2 that's less than 70%. And these people typically need aggressive and effective oxygenation. In most cases, a standard BVM or non-rebreather at 15 liters a minute is sufficient to improve oxygenation. Granted, that's oxygenation and not necessarily ventilation. However, in a small subset of patients, a standard unmodified BVM or non-rebreather just isn't going to be enough. Usually, if a patient does not improve with supplemental oxygen alone, the most reasonable explanation is a physiologic shunt. And this occurs when the lungs are perfused normally, but oxygen delivery to the alveoli is inhibited. You should suspect shunt whenever the patient's SpO2 remains low despite application of high-flow oxygen. In these cases, you need to fully understand the capabilities of your oxygen delivery devices. There's some teaching that we have to repudiate and forsake. The first myth is that a BVM and non-rebreather at 15 liters per minute deliver 100% FiO2. First, let's focus on the BVM. Few really understand the nuances in the BVM mechanics, and we're ruminating on the components because it's essential in properly understanding the common pitfalls associated with BVM ventilation, and the same holds true for the non-rebreather. Not all BVMs are made the same. Due to these variations, the FiO2 that's delivered will vary depending on the manufacturer, and we can't stress enough that none of the BVMs deliver 100% despite what we are taught. Some, depending on the brand, will deliver only around 55%, while some may deliver up to 96%. It's also a common misconception that when you attach a BVM to oxygen, it has to be set on 15 liters per minute. And we're going to go into this a little further in uh, greater detail later on. But Dr. Kovac at the AIM Airway created two excellent videos on YouTube that demonstrates how the flow at the deliverer point, i.e. the mask, is reduced to about one-third of what you'd expect. So it's reduced to one-third relative to what you have your liters per minute set on. The patient does not get the full 15 liters per minute, and in a sick patient who is subtunded but breathing rapidly with a high minute volume, they can quickly collapse the oxygen reservoir and demand more oxygen than your BVM can deliver when it's set to 15 liters per minute. Most BVMs have a similar configuration near where the reservoir is located. There are three valves that we need to discuss. The first valve is so that air from the reservoir can go into the BVM to be delivered to the patient. The second 
valve is an air intake valve that opens when there's insufficient oxygen flow into the bag to keep it shut that prevents the patient from suffocating. The last one at this end of the BBM opens during overpressurization. The two that are there to prevent overpressurization and suffocation are also susceptible to gravity, meaning that there's almost always some room air entrainment which diminishes and dilutes the overall concentration of oxygen that is delivered to the patient through the mask. So to go, uh, so to recap here, when you're looking at the end of your BVM where the oxygen reservoir typically is, there's going to be three valves that are typically located near there. One is near where the oxygen source comes in from the wall and actually goes into the BVM. And that's a one-way valve that just simply allows air to be entrained inside of the reservoir bag and the uh, delivery bag. The other two are actually safety valves. So one is a low or no-flow valve that if there's a malfunction with your oxygen that's coming in from the wall and there's no flow, that patient can actually still get outside air. And then the other one is simply just an overpressure valve. So if you have way too much pressure coming in off the wall, it's not going to cause harm on the patient side of the circuit. And these valves are great for safety reasons, but they also significantly diminish the amount of oxygen that the patient's going to get. And that's one reason that they don't actually get what you think they're getting. When we move down the BVM, if you get to where the mask connects to the BVM, there's a duckbill valve that generally remains closed unless the bag is being squeezed or the patient generates enough negative pressure to open the valve. I want to reiterate this. The duckbill valve, which is near where the mask connects to the BVM, it generally remains closed unless the bag is being squeezed or the patient generates enough negative pressure to open the valve. As the patient actively or passively exhales, the valve closes and the exhaled gas is directed out of the BVM. Some BVMs have a port located on the side for attaching a peep valve. If you have one of these ports, then this is considered an open system. Without something covering this port, such as a peep valve, room air can enter at this point and dilute the oxygen even further which reduces the actual amount of FiO2 delivered to the patient. To have an open system BVM and not attach a PEEP valve significantly decreases its efficiency in oxygen delivery, and open systems, which again are the ones with the port on the side, deliver considerably less oxygen to the patient than does a closed system, which is one without the port on the side. And now you can kind of see, regardless of if you want to use a PEEP valve or not, the PEEP valve should be added to your BVM. If you have an open circuit BVM, a peep valve should be married to your BVM at all times. Now, taking a step back, remember how we said that the duckbill valve remains closed unless the bag is being squeezed or the patient can generate enough negative inspiratory pressure to open it? That generally holds true. But if the BVM is connected to oxygen, the valve does open slightly to allow some, maybe just a few liters of oxygen to get to the patient. Many people will hold the BVM on or hover slightly above the patient's face if they're apneic under the premise that the oxygen being delivered to the patient is the same as the oxygen that's coming from the source. And I hope that we have repudiated this assumption and that we can broach upon the next point. Good God, you are on fire with the Scrabble words today. <laughs> Someone spent extra time with the thesaurus before we started. I did. <laughs> so usually it's ill-advised to ventilate someone that you're preparing to intubate unless it's absolutely necessary or unless you're in the operating theater and the patient has fasted for however, however long. If you're trying to ventilate someone with a BVM without knowing how much air you're delivering or how fast you're squeezing the bag is absolutely a recipe for disaster. But the patient with a significant shunt whose sats are still in the toilet, what other options do you have? Bum, 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 bum. And it's apneic CPAP. So this doesn't necessarily mean slapping a CPAP circuit on someone, but there's ways to generate that positive inspiratory pressure using some equipment you already have available. And this is a concept that was either created by Scott Weingart or made famous by him. And it involves using what you have, which is great for pre-hospital folks, and creates the ultimate oxygenation, pre-oxygenation, or re-oxygenation device. 
And all you need is a BVM, a peep valve, a nasal cannula, and two oxygen sources. So just about everyone out there is going to have all of these. And we all either have two D tanks and a regulator or an ambulance with uh, at least two oxygen ports in it. And I think in most areas that shouldn't really be an issue considering uh, I think, at least in our area, our transport times are relatively short. Now, you may want to reconsider using this method if you're more rural and you have a longer transport time. But I think for most people, this would be fine. And I agree. Absolutely. So here's what you do. You're going to place the nasal cannula under the BVM at 15 liters. Put the BVM at 15 liters and crank the peep up to about 10. When you do that, the nasal cannula will force the duckbill valve open and you will deliver CPAP at about 6 to 8 centimeters of water. Dr. Kovask demonstrates this wonderfully in a cadaver on his YouTube page, and we're going to link to that in the show notes. And we're going to actually embed his YouTube videos uh, in the show notes because we could never recreate something as brilliant as that. Now, is there ever a time when we should be squeezing the bag while we're doing this maneuver? So should we ever squeeze the bag? I, ideally not. When you do this mo- maneuver, it's a temporizing measure and more of a bridge to inserting an advanced airway or providing initial treatment to fixing the inciting insult. Remember, this was created as a method of pre-oxygenation pre-oxygenating the patient during the apnea period. Um, And most of our patients, at least if they still have a pulse, aren't going to be apneic uh, when we uh, arrive at their side. The goal anytime is to improve oxygenation by opening up the alveoli and to not iatrogenically cause gastric distension and aspiration by not squeezing the bag. By providing oxygenation and not ventilation, the only concern is a rise in PaCO2 and worsening acidosis. Generally, the PaCO2 increases about 18 to 16 millimeters of mercury in the first minute of apnea, and it increases about 3 millimeters a minute for each subsequent minute. In most patients, this Moderate increase is clinically insignificant, except for patients who already have severe metabolic acidosis, such as in your sick DKA or severe salicylate salicylate toxicity. Though usually, if we're not providing this therapy to induce apnea, the patient is already breathing on their own, effectively or otherwise. So one could theoretically decrease the risk of gastric distension and aspiration by matching the patient's underlying ventilatory rate and providing apneic CPAP in between breaths. This will, of course, quickly deplete your oxygen stores, so that should be taken into consideration when you're working in a a rural environment like Floyd and I sometimes do. And we can mitigate the risk of aspiration by using perfect BVM technique, but the difficulties of BVM ventilation are frequently underestimated, and we're going to give you some tips and tricks on that right now. So number one is if you're bagging a patient, they can probably stand to be set upright. Number two, utilize airway adjuncts. So your MPA, your OPA, if they don't have a gag reflex, so on and so forth. Three is place the head forward. So you just want to displace that mandible forward into the mask and not push the mask into the mandible. Pushing the mandible forward kind of helps open up some of the posterior airway tissue and allows better facilitation of oxygenation and ventilatory pressures down into the trachea proper. Number four is use two hands to maintain a mass seal and lift the jaw, which kind of goes back to our previous point. Number five is give slow, controlled, and deliberate breaths. So we've all seen the new person, or hell, we've all been there, when you get really amped up and you're bagging this patient at like 30 times a minute. And that is just not okay. Yeah, it's, it's it's pretty common to want to squeeze the bag again once it reinflates. And I think it's now well known that we cannot consciously uh, squeeze the bag at the rate that we intended to do so. That's absolutely right. So kind of to add a little sub bullet point here. Um, if you're like our agency, we have the rescue pod. And that's got a nice little timer light that kind of kind of helps you... Uh, clue in to exactly when you're supposed to squeeze the bag. Uh, my favorite is to just use a entitle 
uh, monitoring circuit. And on our life packs, it will actually give you a respiratory rate. So we can kind of shoot for however, say we're shooting for 12, we can actually monitor off our entitled circuit on our monitors and see, okay, well, this guy's bagging 20 times a minute. We need to back that down to about 10 or 12 or, or whatever we, we desire. And then our last uh, little tidbit here is to use only about a third of the volume of your standard adult BVM. So most of the adult BVMs have way more volume than any one patient is typically going to ever need. How much? It depends on the manufacturer, but can, it can be anywhere between 1,000 and 1,600 uh, mLs of just free volume inside of that bag. Yeah. yeah, I think the one that we use in our department is about 16 to 1,800, which is way more than the patient actually needs. And there, are, there are some very select subsets when high volumes is clinically appropriate, but for the vast majority of our patients, it's not. I know there's actually some agencies and uh, definitely some respected clinicians out there who advise using like a pediatric BVM attached to an adult size mask to kind of help uh, avoid the problem of hyperdynamic inflation or overstretching the uh, causing barrow or volume trauma. And I really don't think that squeezing the bag during the apneic uh, period would be a big deal if we could actually properly use a BVM and and actually sit the patient up a little, use the proper airway adjuncts, use two hands on the mask to actually lift the jaw up so that you lift all of the uh, soft tissue and the epiglottis off of the uh, glottic opening and if you gave it slowly, because if you squeeze the bag too fast, then the trachea can only accommodate so much air at once, but the esophagus is more than happy to accept what the accept what the trachea cannot handle. So, Ron, what about uh, the patient who doesn't have a significant shut, meaning that they um, are ox? they might be able to oxygenate well uh, without a BVM um, or they can't effectively be oxygenated with a BVM. Clearly the answer is to just dominate the airway and go straight for a crack. (laughs) But uh, we now know that based on a recent study by Driver et al. and the Annals of Emergency Medicine, (laughs) that the standard non-rebreather at a flush rate is effective as a BVM in terms of oxygenation in And this is incredibly important to remember in healthy volunteers, meaning that they didn't have any significant underlying lung pathology. So basically what they found out was if you took a regular non-rebreather on a regular person that didn't have any severe underlying lung pathology and you just turn that non-rebreather up on Wildcat, it did as well as a non-rebreather in oxygenating someone. Whoa, whoa. Or as well as a BVM in oxygenating someone. Whoa, so you mean that we can turn the non-rebreather up higher than 15 liters per minute? Oh, hell yeah. (laughs) And this is called what? This is called flush rate oxygenation, or like I call it, turning it up on Wildcat. That goes against everything that I was... (laughs) How dare you? Oh, we will dare. We will (laughs) dare many times on this podcast. So I I think this was a good study. But there are a few limitations. I saw his or I heard his voice get a little louder when he said healthy volunteers. Yeah, that was so, intentional. So that is definitely a limitation um, because they had normal lung physiology. And we already said that you need PEEP or apneic CPAP in the patient uh, who has significant shunt physiology to help with alveolar recruitment. Uh, I think. Another limitation was that the non-rebreather at flush rate was compared to a standard BVM at 15 liters per minute, meaning that the BVM did not have any PEEP on it. Uh, And these were healthy volunteers. This was already stressed. So we should take these results with a a grain of salt since a considerable amount of pre-hospital patients have a physiologic shunt. Additionally, they also ensured the metal clip was compressed firmly against the nose and that the head headband was tightened, which in my anecdotal experience does not happen routinely, and even I just nonchalantly slap it on the face um, in a panic. 
So I th- <laughs> That's I th- utter terror. Utter terror. So it, I know it doesn't happen, but it raises some important points that I think we could go over real briefly. One of which is a concept of flush rate oxygen, oxygenation, uh, that we briefly touched on. The, the actual definition of flush rate oxygen is when the flow rate exceeds 40 liters per minute. Or, with your oxygen regulator turned all the way up, which is blasphemy to some. Like BVMs, not all non-rebreathers are created the same. A true non-rebreather has one-way valves on each side of the mask, and it can deliver nearly 90% FiO2, whereas a standard non-rebreather, which is What most departments probably have, however, I was surprised to see that we have what's considered a true non-rebreather. The standard non-rebreather only delivers about 60 to 70 percent FiO2 at 15 liters, and the standard non-rebreather only has a single one-way valve. So knowing the capabilities of your equipment is essential. I think that there is probably a benefit to having a standard non-rebreather, and that benefit is so that the patient doesn't suffocate if you run out of oxygen. So if I'm uh, I'm just pulling stuff off the truck, how do I know if I have a standard non-rebreather versus a, quote, true non-rebreather? Well, I I would hope you already know. Well, that's that's why we're having this podcast, Floyd. Okay, so we're assuming (laughs) that Ryan doesn't know the difference. Um a standard non-rebreather, or what what is most routinely used now, only has a single one-way valve. So there's like this little uh, rubber gasket uh, that the patient can exhale through. And if you look at your BVM on the sides underneath uh, the nose clip, you'll see there's uh, one side that has just this... Uh, open hole with some fenestrations around it. And then the other side has that open hole, but it also has a gasket on it. If it only has one of those gaskets, then it's a standard non-rebreather. But if it has both of those gaskets, that means that you are good to go because you can deliver nearly 90% FiO2 with that bad boy. Uh, But just make sure you don't run out of oxygen because if it is actually seated on the patient how it's supposed to be, then they'll suffocate to death. So you're saying I shouldn't take a true non-rebreather and just slap it on a panic attack patient without oxygen? No, in- inflate your bag. <laughs> and the bag is important, all right? Pay attention to your bag because if— I do if, spend a lot of time making sure my bag is in operating order. Inappropriate. <laughs> inappropriate. <laughs> PG-13. So— um when you inflate a bag, whether it be on your non-rebreather or your BVM— Pay attention to it. Make sure that it stays fully inflated. If you have a patient on a non-rebreather or BVM at 15 liters per minute, and you can see that the patient's a minute volume is so high that they are sucking that bag down, that it's collapsing when they breathe in, then you need to increase the amount of oxygen or the oxygen delivery rate. Sounds good to me. What do you think? Do we cover everything? Yeah, I think so. Okay. We need a closing statement. (coughs) I don't think we could leave that in the final cut. I need another beer. (laughs) (laughs) But really, guys, we uh, we do strive to try and produce uh, some high quality foam ed for you guys that uh, is geared towards the quote frontline EMS provider uh, that you guys can use in your day to day practice when you get on the truck every day. So like Floyd said, feel free to drop us a line uh, on Facebook, on Twitter or on our website, uh, curvedtobed.com. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you guys. Yeah. Find us on social media. Like our pages. Please. Like our page on Facebook. Please, please. Follow us on Twitter. Um, that way you can receive regular updates. And we're we're real, real responsive to you guys. If you have any questions or comments. The most let responsive. Us know. What? <laughs> I said we're the most responsive. We're the most responsive out of anyone in the social media world, and no one else on FOMED likes you like we do. And that that's a fact. We, we love all of you, each and every one of you. This is Floyd. And this is Ryan. Saying. Bye. <laughs>